All right. Now I've got here, we've got questions, we're all set to go. Okay, it was about that. Let me go ahead. We're recording. This is the high school version. We are talking about mechanical advantage. And it's a basically it's a force mile of a player, but you give up speed. And work equals force time distance. So if you decrease effort, you've got to increase distance. If you or that force, right? To get the same amount of work, if you decrease force, you have to increase the distance. The math of that. Now on a pulley block and tackle, you can just um, just count the number of ropes that are in this. So you're pulling with this, but there's two ropes holding the movable block. That's a two. That's a mechanical advantage of two. In this one, you're pulling it, but now we have three ropes. So it's a mechanical advantage of three. One, two, three, four, four, five, and six. So again, you can lift these things, but it would certainly take you more and more lifting as you go to do them. Okay? And this is an example right there. That final, we talked about the incline plane, wedge, screw, lever, wheel and pulley, wheel and axle, now pulley. All right. And we just talked about that. And um, so what is the IMA, what is the um, ideal mechanical advantage of this one, please? Excellent for all those people that said two. Excellent. All right. So we have two there. Very good. All right. Now, good, good, good. Now let's look at this. What is the IMA of this one? What is the, the ideal mechanical advantage? Remember, we don't always get ideal because of friction, because everything straightens. Uh, it says, oh, well, don't look at the bottom. <laughs> i give you that, Sarah. At least you're calling them out. Sarah says, hey, it's four at the bottom. But go ahead, if you would, please. Okay. Any questions yet? All right. Then So that gives you if you count these there's four. One, two, three, four. So you see the mechanical advantage, okay? Anybody got a question on this? This seems to be pretty straight obvious. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some fa uh, fantastic deals out there of amazing technology. And then we'll talk about Archimedes. And if time permits, we will then, anybody who has not set up a Google site before, we can go through that and talk about HTML and get those folks squared away. So kind of the goal of tonight. All right. Now, Damascus Steel, super famous, super strong, cut through lesser swords. Uh, kept an edge, some remarkably long. You could hit a rock with it, and supposedly it stayed sharp. Usually hit rocks, eh, they're dirty, immediately dull anything. It's flexible as well as strong. They believe that th the materials they were using um, when they were forged created nanotubules. Now, we're not even sure they understood what they were doing. The, the blacksmiths would forge a lot, we think, Forge lots and lots of swords, and those swords that they could test and say, oh, that meets the definition of this Damascus steel, we'll keep those. Uh, this this was lost about 1750. Uh, if you buy something today, it's if it's new, it's not Damascus steel. It's a like it, but it's not it. All right. Next one, and I, I've always been impressed with this, is Roman concrete. It's lasted over 2,000 years. We can't make concrete that last that long. That's the Coliseum. They've lit it up, and they're, uh, they're in the process of completely fixing that bad boy up, by the way, uh, cleaning it up and everything. We know the re ingredients. They listed it in their books. And if we make it, it doesn't turn out as well. And what it makes you think is, hey, we lost our concrete. What other technologies did we lose that we have to reinvent? 
you know. So when we slipped in the dark ages and when the library in Egypt, the Alexander Library, was burned three different occasions, there was a lot of knowledge lost, folks. It's not like the Internet where it's out there forever. It was all gone. Okay, here's another one. Yes, this guy is holding This guy is holding a flamethrower. He is holding a flamethrower. Ancient Greeks made napalm. We reinvented it in the 1940s. All right? So in the 1940s we basically Greek fire, we think it's a, something like napalm. You can drop it, it can get wet, it still burns. It's very nasty stuff. All right. Okay. Let me see. Guys, can you hear me? Raise your hand. If you can hear me, raise your hand. Okay. Hey, your sound isn't working. Uh, Brian, I think everybody else can hear me. Let me go here. All right, so I'm not sure, Brian, check your technology. You forgot what happened. That's what happens with eye surgery. Napalm? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Sarah, Sarah, explain to me napalm on eye surgery. If you unmute, unmute yourself, Sarah. All right, well, write your answer down because I'm kind of curious. That's a new one, I mean. But I do love that guy doing a flamethrower. All right. Now, we got a Hero Steam Engine. Let me get rid of this one. I'm going to delete that slide. All right. It's called Hero Steam Engine. Let's see it in action. This was a writer who lived out of the Library of Alexandria. Look at all of his work, and we probably lost. Um, he was a writer, an engineer, or a scientist. Here, we're going to watch it here. I'm going to see if I can get the code so you can see it at home as well. Oh, darn it. Okay, let's see it in action. Bear with me. I'm going to hit view. Now let's see if we can get it one more time here. Copy link address. I'll put it all in here if you can't get to it. Get appreciation for what this fellow was doing. Something you could make at home. Sorry, I got to add. So you're basically heating up this copper ball and it's spinning things. And apparently he used this to open and shut curtains. Which is pretty fabulous. So Heron or Hero, whatever it is, made a steam engine. And you just think if if the data could have been shared and other people would have realized his work, you know, and, that, so, and they could have discovered steel a little bit earlier. And the Romans were close to discovering steel when the Dark Ages rolled in. Um, we might have had railroads a thousand years ago. Just think what, it, what we lost by that. We lose knowledge. All right. Okay, let's go back here. All right. Also, you go out there and look. There's a ro They call it a robot. I, that's a little bit of a stretch. Where it goes back, left, and right. Oh, great. Here we go. Eh, I don't really want to hear this. All right. Okay. Now, the next one is called Baghdad Battery. And these are all ones that we can done, we've duplicated, so these are legit technologies. Um, a positive terminal, 
You got a negative terminal. There's your seal. There's your electrolytes were in, put in there. They have an iron rod and a copper cylinder. You know, this is like um, oh, 75 millimeters on some of the 3-inch diameter kind of thing. It's not really super big. We think it was used in religious, you know, they're guessing. Religious ceremonies, people would have gotten a light shock, you know, and, and, and the people doing the religious ceremony might have thought that was their power. Um, then the next thing we want to do is, um, so we have that. And they also used it, we think, with gold plating, plating things. You can imagine, if you had a battery and you could plate metal, that would have been real impressive. So we did find that battery. And again, you wonder, how oh, you found a battery. What might have been if we would have just taken it a little bit farther? This is pretty neat. This was kind of discovered by accident. Uh, the British had this. It's a Roman cup. and But when they noticed they put a light on it, it would change color from green to red. They finally figured out what's going on. The Romans inadvertently discovered nanotechnology. They cr ground up gold and silver in a nanos in the nano-sized flakes and put it into the glass inside the making of the glass itself. So when you put in light next to it, it would change colors. Which I think is pretty darn cool. Then a Viking compass, what they would do is they would float in a bowl a compass which most people, you know, the compass part is a start, but they would, by adding a crystal, that would allow you to magnify the light, the existing light. And they found their compass was within four degrees accuracy, which is a modern compass. So the Vikings were way ahead on that one. Okay. Any questions on these? Let me know. Okay. Now... In China, we don't really have a picture of this right now, but in China, they made natural gas lines. All right? So they made natural gas lines, and they mined for salt. And they would go down quite a bit, 500 feet. So uh, using bamboo, they were making gas lines, and they'd take the gas out. When they were mining, they would ship the gas off and then burn it for light and energy, basically what we're doing. All right. These are all things that we've dug up, we found proof, we really look at the details, we recreate it, and we go, okay. These are the things that just aren't. Sometimes you see people, they see these gold objects, they go, wow, it looks like an airplane. They must have had airplanes. No, in their religion, they had lots of different symbols of birds. This is most likely a birds. All right, we haven't found any half-built airplanes somewhere. All right. All right, let me see here. Bear with me one second. We've got... All right, now. Spark plug found in a 500-year-old rock. The spark plug was actually made in the 1920s. The soil where they were doing the sampling, they went back and resampled... The sampling, they mistakenly got into some trash with their sampling. So there is no 500-year-old spark plug. No aliens gave it. And then finally, as ancient astronauts, you will hear arguments from people saying, you'll hear people saying, um, that, well, they couldn't have possibly came up with this. It took astronauts. I, I find it insulting when I hear people say to me, well, the UFO crashed. That's why we discovered computers and digital, because it was all in, you know, this alien abduction thing. No, you had a brilliant physicist who happened to be a maker who could work with his hands, and he was able to work with two other guys, and they made a transistor. Well, magical. Anything magical about it at all. All right. So what we're going to do next is my man, Archimedes. And I'm going to, let me back up here. Let's get our guy here. Okay. Here's Archimedes. Um, the problem with 
the sad thing and both the sad and good thing in a um, as war is is it first of all it kills off your engineers it kills off your leaders there's a, in the final analysis there's nothing good about it but it does hasten technology whether we like that or not I think there's a lot better ways to hasten technology though than killing each other any case one of the great mathematicians maybe the greatest mathematician until Newton comes along is Archimedes all right he will invent three he invents a lot of things uh, simple machines the lever etc but he had three machines that were pretty impressive the claw it's a simple machine he did a death ray and the steam cannon and we can make all this stuff so this isn't a pretend I'm going to show you a video it's going to run six minutes um, in a minute about Archimedes um, and while that's on I'm going to try to get this other student on we've got a student that can't get on so bear with me one second um, you know advances math you know Roman and Greek weaponry was really big remember the Romans were really outnumbered the Greeks so the Greeks had to think of things so here is you know from Sicily's Archimedes so let's go ahead we'll run this and sorry I got this silly commercial All right. With a five star overall safety rating and a standard air vision camera. It's 213 BC. All right, here we go. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and put this up here loud for everybody. Bear with me one second here. And when Rome began to expand, Syracuse was. Try again. It's 213 BC. And Syracuse here in Sicily is a critical link in the chain of running back its Greek Empire. The Roman Empire is on the ascendant, and Syracuse is their next stop. The Greeks built a number of city-states dotted around the Mediterranean, and when Rome began to expand, Syracuse was right in the way. Unfortunately for the Romans, this was the home of the genius Archimedes. He fortified the city walls with such incredible military contraptions that he stopped the Roman war machine dead in its tracks. One of those contraptions was the claw, a kind of crane that reached out over the city walls, grabbed the enemy Roman ships, and dashed them on the rocks. I'm going to make it so it's easier for you to watch it on your own computer because it doesn't look so great. was the greatest mathematician of the ancient world, and probably the greatest mathematical genius until Isaac Newton. His inventions range from the famous Archimedes screw to water clocks, pulleys, winches, and many more. When the Roman fleet approached Syracuse, legend tells us that Archimedes set fire to the enemy galleys with a new invention. But how did he do it? In a local school, there's a statue of Archimedes, which holds a clue to this devastating invention. It's possible that this large dish was a highly polished bronze shield that harnessed the power of the sun. The mirror on my bathroom wall might double as an ancient bronze shield. Okay, well the Greek soldiers may have used their shields and then they could reflect the sun onto the boats, a bit like that. So how would it feel to be an invading Roman on the receiving end of this new weapon? If the Greek soldiers had lined up along the harbour walls, the reflection of the sun off their polished bronze shields would have acted like mirrors, concentrating the sun's energy onto the Roman ships. And the soldiers would have been completely dazzled, if nothing else. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to see where they were going at all. What further damage could they do if the Greeks had hundreds of shields, all reflecting the power of the Mediterranean sun at the hapless Romans? So, Marty, what have you got here? Well, I've got a few mirrors here. 124, ah. to be precise. <laughs> wow! 124 hexagonal polished wow. steel mirrors. Oh, and each one is held in the centre and individually adjustable. On the back are four screws for each mirror, and that allows you to adjust it. Oh, you can it, steer them all. And I can steer each mirror and, and focus, focus them. onto well, the boat. Well, I, I happen to have a Roman boat in my hand. We just, we'll see what we can do. You think you can set fire to this? We'll try. Pop on, on the post. The, pop it on the post. Okay, well, hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Don't fire yet. There. Right, are you okay, ready? Do Here your you worst. Go. Here we go. Coming up. 
Oh, that's bright. That is very bright. I can't even look at that. I have to look at the back of it. There's smoke beginning to appear already. I can see the paint's blistering. Yes. There it is. No, I think that would be very bad news. And you couldn't possibly attack now with this blast of, of ray gun in your eyes. And I think if I were a Roman sailor, I wouldn't fancy being in that boat very much. I have to say, Marty, yeah. that even though there aren't flames, you have burnt a hole in the side of this boat. Okay, I can see straight through see. from the inside. Ooh. So that boat is now sinking. Me. Now I've locked it off now, so let me come and have a quick look. Right. Well, don't get too close. Okay, yeah, so he's taking out the whole side. Ah, oh, flames! 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 flames. Fantastic! Okay, that well, really is go, that boat. There you go. All right, yeah, actually, you have to dial. Yes. And you only need 124 mirrors. Oh, and this is in, you know, um, six, in four, Southern six, Italian sun, I think. 307-1722. Write this down. 646-307. The part of the Roman Navy. A triumph for Archimedes. 646-307-1722. The pressure of war forced the Greeks to be inventive. Okay, 646 They were at the cutting edge of weapon technology. Their military engineers made clever two, use two. of ratchets, winches, and multiple pulleys. No, two, two. They set principles six, four, of design six, that lasted seven, for a thousand one, years. Seven, two, two. Back in 400 right. BC, even Sir. the simple bow was improved by their inventiveness. This is David Sim. Six who four six three zero seven one seven two two. Here's your access your code. Belly bow. All David, right. Show me. Here's your access code. That slide up six three two okay. one seven five five, five zero one. The hook goes over the string. Oh, I see, like that. That's it. Right. Now push the two brass pieces. You see forward. the access These code? Ones. Did you yep. get that? Right. And pull the trigger Brian. lever round to the right. Oh, I see. So that locks that down onto the string. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Brian, now, then to load it, right? You got to have an access this is code. Really Six walls, three two one so seven five five zero one. Push against the wall, right? Put your belly against it. Did you get it, that? Right? Six three two one seven five okay. five zero one. And that cocks it. That's very cunning. Okay, now you put it back on the castle wall. Did you get that? Onto the castle wall. Like All right, that. then right. access pin thirty one. It's Take the last thing. Access pin now, thirty one. Yes. yes, You got that? And All right, good. Notch it. Let me know. Right. Write me a question. I'll look for and you it. Pull that lever. And wow! Wow! Fantastic power. So you reckon that's twice as powerful as a normal bow? You can make a bow that's two or three. It okay. would be even better. I'm going to re-show this, folks. I had to get the voice for uh, Brian, whose sound went off. Here, it sounds yeah, working. Absolutely, it's good for Archie. The pressure of war forced the Greeks to be inventive. They were at the cutting edge of weapon technology. Their military engineers made clever use of ratchets, winches, and multiple pulleys. They set principles of design that lasted for a thousand years. Back in 400 BC, even the simple bow was improved by their inventiveness. This is David Sim, who is our ancient weapons expert, and this is a gastrophites, or belly bow. David, show me. Right. That slider pushes forward. Okay. Yeah. How far? Ooh. Keep going until the hook goes over the string. Oh, I see. Like that. That's it. Right. Now push the two brass pieces forward. These ones? Yep. Yeah. Right. And pull the trigger lever round to the right. Oh, I see. So that locks that down onto the string. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, now, then, to load it, right, this is really a castle wall, isn't it? Yes. So you shove it, shove it against the wall. You will push it against the wall. Right. Put your belly against it. And right. Push. Like that. I see. And that, that cocks it. That's very funny. Okay, now you put it back on the castle wall. Put it back onto the castle wall like that. Right. Take your arrow. And these are just ordinary arrows, yes? Yes. yes. And notch it. Notch it. Right. And then have you fire. And you pull that lever, and wow, wow, fantastic power. So you reckon that's twice as powerful as a normal bow? You can make a bow that's two or three times more powerful than a bow that a man can pull with his arms. Gosh. And all the strength is in pushing this forward. So you've got double the range. You can yes. keep the enemy well out of bow shot. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. And you don't need to be a skilled archer to use it. That's, anyway. that's extraordinary. This was probably the first ever mechanical weapon of war. It was a real step forward. All 
All right. Okay. So, needless to say, he's a mastermind, mathematician, all these good things. Here is... Do you all have your sound now? Can you hear me now? All right, good. I saw we lost some people. That's very frustrating. All right, now... Okay, now let's look at this bad boy, okay? This thing right here is Archimedes' claw, all right? And this literally using a lever and pulleys could raise a huge ship off the ground and then drop the ship back in. Once the ship's out of the water, if you drop it, it's going to shatter under its own weight. Ship isn't built to be dropped. Here's, let me show you a real quick video of this. This is a Vimeo. Watch this. Watch this. This is an animation. So going down, you got this hook, and you'd have a group of guys pulling on the ropes of this. They got a mechanical advantage. They probably have weights on this rope and everything. See how that pulley could let loose. Watch it now what it does to this ship. It could go both. And what was great about this, it go up or down, left or right. Watch. There you are paddling. Uh-oh. Boom. That's one sunk ship. You gotta admit, that's pretty freaking ingenious. I know, the video's laggy. Here, let me help you out here. So... Here, let me give you this. If you want to see this as well, and see, this allowed, they're using both a lever and a pulley system to do this. See right there? You can see the hook here coming up. The idea was to lift the ship up. They'd use a pulley, then it would break loose. And you got to let the energy go or it would break this up. So it's really very ingenious. You don't want to, you want that ship to come off. You don't want the ship to stay, stay on there. Because that way you could reuse it. So another pretty ingenious piece of equipment. Okay? Got any, I got questions there. Let me see. Yeah, I'm sorry the video's laggy, but hopefully it's better now. All right, now. Combination special with a lever and a pulley in order to lift the ship. That's this thing right here because it could go up and down or left or right. The idea was... They would use people or oxen to lift the nose of the ship up and drop it, right, as you could do that. And if we did the calculations, and I'll save the PDF if you'd like to see it, it actually works. They figured out the math behind us, how big things needed to be, what the fulcrum length was, what would work. And there's some Lego people built. If you go here, you can go to this site. And he's built one out of Legos. I'm dropping that up. 
So if you go there, you can go to videos. Let me send this. Let's see how they did it out of Legos. Now, let's go on this. Fulcrum's and pulleys would control large wooden hooks. Pull it up. We got it. You know, we talked about what a pulley is. We just did. And we theoretical and actual mechanical advantage. This one, from what we just said about pulleys earlier, this has a mechanical advantage of one. So it's not really. It just changes the direction of work. This one has two because it has two supports to it. And now this one, you can start counting off with this. This has got a bunch of different pulleys off of it. We see these. There's different ways of playing with that. You got your load of fixed pulley, a movable pulley, and then block and tackle. So there's a lot of derivatives of this. Okay? So why did they why did they need the block and tackle? They got a lever. Well, you would have what was the trade-off? What would you have had to do to the lever to get it to work then? If you didn't have that block and tackle, you're just going to do it as a lever. If you had it pointed down, what's the problem with that? Any ideas? If you think about it, here it is. They're using that fulcrum to lift this up to get it over the wall. You, you could put a pivot point and have a rope and try to pull it down, and that's probably what they did. They probably tried to make the lever out. But by using a block and pulley now, it required fewer people. Yep, you need a lot more length. And, and when you just make a good point there, it gets harder and harder to pull that bad boy up. So, yes. It was a combination. And remember, he invented the lever. He invented the pulley. So Archimedes was doing some incredible things there. All right. Now, um, the Archimedes and that sun-reflecting weapon, that actually works. You go on YouTube, you can see you can light up your car at 250 degrees. In fact, this summer, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to try to make each one of these things. Just because I think it would be cool to try it out. So what the, how this works is, every one of the soldiers would go out there with their shields. That was the idea, or mirrors. And they would put it all towards that one boat. Now, of course, yeah, Sarah says... Can I help? Yeah, we'll try to figure out a time. Let's see if we can get everybody out there. Maybe that'll... Usually we have an extra lab. Maybe that's what we'll play with that day. I think it'll be really fun to do. All right. Now, if you use a spherically shaped mirror, you get many focal points. But a parabolic, put a little more bend to this thing, those spherical aberrations, everything's going to go right there. But the same thing of putting a shield each way would have the same... You know, once again, you've got one focal point. So my guess is, when they did it, he must have parked a ship out there, one they didn't like, had all the armors with their shields, soldiers with their shields, had them polished, and then they would practice. Because all they'd have to do is get where that focal point is. And I'm sure the first times... I'm sure the first few times they did it, um, it took some practice. But could you imagine the Romans when they showed up the first time that happened? I mean, it's amazing. And here's the sun-focusing mirror. We can use that to cook with. That's what they're doing here. And honestly, we use that thermal tank. We use oil, use these parabolic troughs, and that's how we're making energy. Now look at that. That's basically what this all is. They're heating up right here these lines that oil inside there so you look over to my left there's like an oil line going down there all that sun's hitting the oil line and then we store it as energy dish systems do that to a certain extent so you know and here's look at all these mirrors on this tower again 
you know, they're just doing a version of what he was thinking about 200 years before Christ. Uh, that doesn't, I don't know, that really impresses the heck out of me. Now, he didn't have gunpowder then. Uh, the Chinese had it. Um, and maybe, let's be glad, they, but their gunpowder wasn't really working that well. To get gunpowder to be really useful, believe it or not, you have to add nitrogen. And believe it or not, that mostly you have nitrogen you can get from urine. So I don't know how we discovered that uh, that was a good mixture, but somehow maybe a horse went on it and still had to use it, and they realized it was better or something. I don't know. So what he does is you're going to increase in this one, you're heating it up again. You've got a water valve and a reservoir, reservoir, reservoir. There's your projectile. What's going to do, here's the water injector, right? Here's the valve. You wait till the power's up, and it's going to blow it right through. So consider the states of matter. you got solid, you got some vibration with liquid, then gas, everything's breaking loose. If the temperature of a container is increased, the pressure increases. We all know that. Put a lid on a bowling jar. So, as you start off, the pressure in this thing keeps ca increasing because we got it capped. Whoops. So, as it gets hotter and hotter, now we're up to one atmosphere is normal. Now it's going even faster. So, let's watch this. Okay, where's... It's time to light this homemade super weapon up. This is the first time he attempts to fire it. We're going to find out today whether Archimedes was right, whether the steam pen could have fired, and I couldn't be more excited. Archimedes' design is based on using water heated up to extreme temperatures over an open fire to create steam. When the steam is released, it propels a cannonball. Working with steam under this kind of pressure can be deadly. We're going to fire a five-pound cannonball 150 feet using nothing but a couple ounces of water. We open the valve, and that's all it takes. Steve has to heat the cylinder enough so that the steam climbs to a pressure of at least 150 PSI. I love how you drink some of the water. The pressure's climbing! Here we go, baby. We're ready to test this thing. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Holy crap, look at that! <laughs> awesome! Check it out. Proof positive. They said it couldn't be done. They said it was impossible. Archimedes, you were right, and mwah, 200 feet. Beautiful. That blows me away. Archimedes had it all right, and I think we just proved it. All right. So Archimedes using a cannon like that, excuse me, basically showed him how, hey, we can make a cannon using compressed air. You know, so... As far as the steam engine, if he's getting on this, again, this is where materials engineering is important. The, Ro the Greeks at this time, the Romans, didn't have steel. Because if they had steel, hey, guess what? They could be making um, steam engines. And all we're really doing here is you've got a piston rod that's in here. Your piston, let me go get going here. All right, so high-pressure steam in. There's your steam exhaust. As this expands, it causes the piston push out. And it goes around and around. And this crosshead drags across what you're trying to move. There's your slide valve of how much gas you're letting in and out. It goes up right here. Like this end goes here. Here it is. It pushes down, then rotates back, pushes down. It keeps going over and over again. That's your steam engine. All right. And honestly, we use steam to make all of our electricity, whether... We use, you know, chemical energy. We take coal and burn it, natural gas. Use nuclear. 
solar, you ultimately just boil water. Oh my, I hate this. You boil water, you get superheated steam because it's going to be under pressure. It turns these turbines. They generate electricity that goes to your home. And then as they spin out, the water comes back into a condenser, back into here. Or in the Lake Norman with their nuclear power plants. And their reserve. Someone asked, did they use bronze? Or what was their substitute? Well, they could use iron and they could use bronze, but those two things are brittle. It's not to introduce carbon into iron that you get steel. Now you got something that's new. All right. I think it's interesting that, you know, a steam engine, we're still using that basic idea of, hey, we, you know, we just expand heat in water into a gas, and then we turn things with it. Okay. Now, any questions on that? We will be next week um, starting to build more of our stuff as everybody's gotten their materials in. Has anybody built something out of their many weapons of mass destruction yet? Their siege engines. Raise your hand if you did. Well, next week... All right, Joseph did. Let me ask Joe, what did you make? All right. Joe, what did you make? I made the crossbow. Very nice. All right. Well, we're going to, with the high school kids particularly, I want to make the trebuchet. I think the thing looks cool as can be. So we'll be building that. I've got a list of uh, things we'll make um, as class is going on. All right. Go ahead and mute him. Sweet. Excellent. All right, now, folks, if you have a Google site, please put pictures of what you make on there. So when you apply for college, you have good stuff, okay? Um, I'm not going to make people who did a Google site have a Google site sit through building a Google site. But I will for the people that are here that haven't or don't know. Is anybody in here who doesn't know how to make a Google site? Let me put everybody's hands down. All right, so I got a couple people that don't. So I'm going to go ahead, work those people. Everybody else can log off, and I'll start to show you where to go on a Google site. Okay? And if there's no other questions, uh, we have labs really starting next week. Charlotte, we have one Tuesday, Harrisburg Thursday. Um, and then we're in and Raleigh will be then as well as um, I'm in Winston-Salem. All right? So, you folks, that if you want to see how we did Google Sites again, that's fine. Otherwise, we're going to hold off here. So I'm going to go here. Go to Ancient Engineering. That's less than three Google Site. Okay. Because we have 10 minutes, I want to get you started on this. We're going to go right to this slide. I'm going to save the slides and put them up. So if you want to break it down, you can. A lot of slides on this. All right, so here's Google Sites. Do you two have an email address, a uh, Google email? Raise your hand if you have a Google, Google email address. Very nice. Good. You can do this then. All right, you'll need a Gmail account, and it tells you how to make one. We're not going to worry about that. Okay. Now, what you can do, okay, here we go. No, that's not working the way we wanted it to. All right, so here's basically, you're going to blank template, you got classroom site, soccer site, spring floral. In other words, you can put different sites under your location. And we're going to go ahead and start this. So what I want you to do is I want you to find Google Site. So go up and you can search to find Google Site. It'll be, let me back up here a little bit. After you get your Gmail, make sure you're on Gmail. 
And then where it has, if you look up at your Gmail, I don't know if you can see this, I'm going to put it up here. Let me go ahead. So, up here in my screen, I hope you can see this. I've got this. I can click on that, right? Gmail, YouTube, Maps. I look under More. I can start looking for sites. And yours probably, I purposely have used this one because I mean, may use my site on here, so it's going to look for it. So I go down here until I find Google Sites. Let me get a little bit farther. All right, let me see here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, calculator boys, iCloud print. Sheet. All right, let me go here. Books, Pikes. Wait a minute, folks. Here it is. Google Sites. So you click on that. And I have one, Mr. Dubik Super Site Fall. About me. My interest. My projects, not really site map. All right, so if you get the home, go ahead to home. This is an example goes as this is where I can share my work with the world, as we say. Okay, so let's go back here. Once you log in at Google site, you're going to select the template, name your site, which will automatically fill out. Whatever you name your site, it's going to show up there. So let's go up there. Let's go to Google site. Let's create one. All right, so everybody look at what I've got there. I'm creating it. All right, so let me go ahead. Again, we're getting people with issues here. So, here's select the site to use. You got classroom site, soccer team, spring floral. Brian, let's just name your site. I would go with the blank site, test X. All right. And then you got to type in a code so that way they know you're not a bot. And of course, I can never read these things properly. What is this? C I O P S. C I O P S. O W N I E S. Okay, so they won't let me use text XX, so I'll do. All right. All right. So there's my test XX, even though it says it's not a site. Up here is where you edit pages, where you create a page, and you can do more action. So if you can't figure out what you want, that's probably where you're going to go. All right. So here's my home page. This is where everything is on it. I can start editing this page. I'm going to edit. And this is my home page. All right. And you hit it, save it. And this is my home page shows up. Go ahead right now. All right, go ahead right now and make your home page. Get it to this point right here. Then raise your hand so I know that you got to this. And now I'm going to show you how to add the pages underneath it. All right, Sarah's got her home page. Let's go ahead. Daniel, once you got yours, we'll get moving.
Daniel, you got it? All right, excellent. Now, chances are you're going to want to add pages underneath it. So I'm going to add a page right here. Name your page. I'm going to say, um, um, say I make a catapult or siege weapons. All right, so there's siege weapons. This is where I will put picture. All right. Now, when we teach this in the fall, we actually get an HTML code. We're not really doing that. So I'm going to save. All right, so you get your home page. And then underneath the home page is your siege weapons. And I can still do things here. I'm going to edit this page. All right. Then go up here off this very same top up here, right? And I can insert an image. So I'll upload an image. Would be one thing. I could do a web address. All right. So say I want to upload an image. I could put that up there. Hit that. And look for on my desktop to get an image. All right. Let me do this one right there. All right, save. All right, and just an icon, I, mechanical advantage, which is not much of a thing to say, but that's what I have on there. Okay, so basically, I get my home page, and then underneath it, I would put the different things I'm doing. You can insert photos there, the whole nine yards. Make sure you go to the pencil. Up here's all your choices. Insert, and then, you know, you can put links, text boxes, all of it right there. Okay? So hopefully I'll get you started on this. All right. If that's okay, I've got a couple students that are still struggling to get on, on their webinars. So we're going to go ahead and uh, try to finish it up there. Let me go help them. So... Any questions about this, guys? And then next week, it's time for uh, catapults. We'll start building some of our own. Okay? Sarah, if you want to make some catapults and send me some pictures, I'll put them out there for people to see. Got a question? Let me see. Um, I put them on... I put the videos, oh good, I'm glad your catapult went 30 feet. Um, I put them on Edmodo and I put them on YouTube. But that doesn't, I used to do Google Plus, but it felt like nobody was doing Google Plus. I'm going to go ahead and stop this video. Let me stop the recording.